orchestral movie score stuff to salsa to pop music and you know it doesn't doesn't matter what happens you just got to go and and do it and then after that we have like about a 40 minute break and then we get back to doing the show live at 5 p.m and that's a typical run day about a 14 to 15 hour day and so anything that you guys perform during the day is fair game for them to use on the air in case something goes oh, wrong. Oh, uh, we've had a few times where a uh, performer, uh, a pro dancer, or a celebrity dancer gets injured during dress rehearsal, which means then they can't perform for the actual show. <laughs> so what they do is they'll use a rehearsal from the morning that we did just rehearsing with them, and they'll use that as a performance. So for for us, the red light's always on. We're always being recorded. And every time we rehearse it, it's really a performance because it's being recorded. So starting at 5 a.m., you got to be on for the whole day for 14 hours. Yes, that's that's the, that's the job. OK. And uh, <laughs> how'd you get that gig? Um, since 2008, I've been working for all these various TV shows in town, like uh, American Idol, The Voice, America's Got Talent. So I've been in the circle of roster of people uh, just sort of as a as a sidelining musician where you're you're on stage but not really playing. Uh, even though we recorded the music, we're on stage not really playing. We're just mimicking. So I've been doing that for for a long time now. And so I was in this list of people. But when they decided to expand the trumpet section on Dancing with the Stars, there was a very small list of people that were in, that are being considered to be on the actual show. So. Before I got the full-time gig, this previous season, I was coming in to do some on-camera spots. So I, I knew the people already, but when it came time to the section being expanded, my name got put in the list and I came in for a trial run. And I think I was the only guy that came in for the actual trial run. And I ended up getting the gig after that. When you came in for that trial run, were you nervous? Yes. <laughs> Because I've been there before just to be on set or on the stage sidelining. I've never been there to actually do the whole recording process, which is pretty, it's, you know, it's stressful because I remember we'll have like, I remember the, the, one of the first shows I did, we had to come in and do Michael Bublé's uh, Feeling Good that has a bunch of double C's all over the place. Uh, that was one of the songs. One of the, follow the next song was uh, Aaron Copeland's Hold Down just a, a short excerpt of it. And then after that, we had to come back and do uh, this Disney uh, sort of quasi bluegrass jazz type of thing for this film called Princess, Princess and the Bride. Uh, sorry, the Princess and the Bride, um, uh, Princess Frog. It has a big old ripping uh, trumpet solo on there. They had to do that and then come back and do a bunch of flugelhorn um, ballad like flugelhorn stuff that's very sensitive and quiet. So if you're doing this stuff, you know, back to back to back uh, for a two hour show, that's pretty difficult enough, but having to do that for 14 hours straight, I mean, they're, they're looking for a specific person that, you know, wanted that. So when they hired me or thought about me to do that, they're like, well, he has the chops for it, but can, does he have the endurance? Does he have the mindset to not be an asshole for 14 hours <laughs> before showtime? So it's stuff like that, it gets very stressful that they were considering as well from just having the person even do the job. And so what is the hardest part of the gig for you? Is it the range? Is it the endurance? Is it something else? The hardest part of that gig, I think for the whole band entirely, it's, uh, it's focusing. Stay, having to stay uh, at a mindset of 90% or higher for 14 hours straight is very exhausting and very stressful. So we all sort of have learned, this might sound a little weird, but we sort of learned to perform at a 7% and make that sound like a 90% effort, if not higher. It's because if, we, if we're always at 100%, we're gonna, we're gonna fade out very, very quickly. So at a 14 hour day, we're performing at 70%, but it's still, everything is still accurate and it sounds great, but we're, we're not working too hard to get to the show time when we actually give it the full, the full throttle. Okay, and, that, and I know you guys are like in, you guys are in in-ear monitors and stuff like that. And I know that you have embraced the technology um, yeah. Not only at Dancing with the Stars, but in the other things you, you're doing, whether it's a casual gig or whatever. Do you have any yeah. advice to anybody about is that important nowadays? Is why did you do it? Um, do you enjoy well, it? Yeah, it's it's important because uh, especially with using the whole in your system, 
um, if you have the, 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 the fortune <laughs> to actually have a situation where you have an in-ear system, it's all about just understanding that you can't overplay. You're playing into the microphone. It's almost a studio mindset. You're playing in front of the microphone. So all the sounds happening right here, you don't have to go so hard, but you still have to have the intent of the sound that you're going for in your mind, which makes it very convincing to sound like you're playing real loud when you're not playing real loud. But man, it is a complete chop saver. If I was doing the 14 hour day without in your systems or my or microphone right there, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody can do that for 14 hours straight, including myself. You know, I think I could, I'm able to, you know, be consistent for that long of a day because we have the whole in your system. And it's definitely the technology makes it makes it easier. It's still hard, <laughs> but it's, you know, it makes it more bearable to, to not just chop out in the first few hours. So it's hard, but do you have any fun doing the gig? Oh yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, there's a bunch of pro dancers right in front of us, just doing their thing, rehearsing all day, and we're playing. I'm playing with this amazing band, and whether it's a, a pop chart or a lead chart or some orchestral thing, where I got to bring out the piccolo trumpet and play stuff. I mean, uh, I'm being tested both mentally and physically in the best capacity. You know, where you're gonna have a possible million ears and eyes watching, if not more than that. So. It's pretty exciting. It's very exciting. Nice. Well, the most important dancing with the stars question I have, and then we'll move on to some other things is, uh, <laughs> so have you ever danced with one of the stars? Uh, we, uh, the horn section has been on stage multiple times, multiple times. And we have uh, rap parties. Um, uh, I got to dance with Amber Rose, this uh, sort of uh, Instagram model who's very, very famous. She was dating a bunch of huge big name rappers and basketball players and she was on the show got to dance with her on dance on the after party for dancing with the stars so it happens for sure <laughs> okay so let's let's go back to um kind of your early trumpet life what was mm -hmm. the thing i'm assuming as a kid that attracted you to the trumpet pbs pbs when i was a uh, fifth grade going to sixth grade i was always sitting in front of the tv watching PBS and a certain time in the afternoon or evening, they would have this live concert series where they would cover any sort of Western style music, whether it's from jazz or classical, or everything in between, in between, they would have a video, basically a, a music video series where you, you hear a Baroque ensemble or an or orchestra or a big band. Uh, and that's what, you know, sort of got me started just in, into the trumpet. Well, the trumpet is the one that really got my eye at a very young age. And from there, I just, I asked my parents, how can I start playing this instrument? So how old were you when you started playing? Uh, I think I started when I was 13, 13 years old. And were you always a good player? Or did, it, did some of it come easily <laughs> for you or did you struggle um, in the beginning? I was the youngest of five um, and I had a lot of free time. So it definitely, it definitely was not easy, but because I had so much time, I had a lot of patience to just, I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, and you can ask any of my family members that did not sound good for many, many years. So it, it didn't come easy. I had to work for it for sure. Okay. And I know that, um, I know now you've told us you did even as a, as a young child. And I know nowadays you still put a lot of time in trying to get improved because obviously you're a great player already, but I, I don't think you look at it that way. I think you look at the trumpet is being limitless. Can you explain that a little bit and what motivates you to try yeah. to do things like the Clark etude and push the limits? Yeah. Well, I grew up with, and I'm, I'm a local native to Los Angeles, so I grew up with lots of amazing musicians. And I mean, for me, the majority of my teachers have been peers that I grew up working with or playing with. And then from job to job to rehearsal to rehearsal, you, you always see and hear these amazing players, whether it's trumpet or trombone or saxophone or piano or any instrument, you see at the level they're at. And I thought I always thought to myself at a young age, I want to be able to do that on my instrument. So I was always chasing the best player, not in a, a, a negative competitive way, but I was like, I want to be able to do that as well. So I've had that mindset at a very young age. So the people who I grew up with, another person I grew up with, with uh, Eric Jovell, him and I went to the same middle school and high school. Um, so he, he was the person I was always chasing uh, for a very long time as a kid. Uh, and we're good friends now, um, even back then. But 
I was always chasing him, not trying to beat him. I just want, I want, look, look what I can do. Now the time to push you to go even further. And that was always the mindset. So, I mean, just watching all these people around me who were incredible, I wanted to be one of those guys who can do the high note stuff or the solo stuff or, or solo in the classical style. So I was always chasing them. And then with the invention of YouTube, YouTube, man, YouTube, talk about expanding that horizon. YouTube, there's countless of videos of guys and musicians just doing incredible things. So when you see something that's great, you want to at least get to that level or surpass it in, in some capacity. Yeah. And when so you're that, playing a rehearsal, if you're playing a rehearsal or a gig or a recording session, do you ever surprise yourself with what you can do? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we're going to have a gig uh, in March 24th with uh, this uh, composer, trumpet player in town named Dave Richards who's from North Texas. He's doing a bunch of music for Airman and Note. Um, he uh, writes these songs that are incredibly hard, incredibly fun. And there was one tune, very top of the rehearsal, uh, 10 a.m., uh, I think it's called Beautiful Love. And at the very end, um, it goes up from a high F sharp to a double B. Uh, and they're all half notes in, uh, in, uh, in three, four. And this is line that keeps repeating F sharp G B A and do 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 happens about four or five times. And the very last time it says, you know, take it up the octave, which I do. And then this one time I was feeling great. It was early. All of, all of a sudden I get to that point and I had such a big grip on that high note that I started shaking it. I was shaking it up to D sharps. And it was clean, it was in tune, and it was controlled. And when I did it, I put the horn down. My buddy next to me was looking at me and just laughing. And I was like, wow, that was easier than it should have been. It was really easy. <laughs> so do you believe if you can do it once, you can do it a hundred times? Well, that's that's the that's the theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, and, and who um what what let's let's talk about I know you studied from different people. You know, mm -hmm. Bill Bing and Wayne, I think, and some others, John Fumo, I believe, and maybe Howie. Mm -hmm. Is is there any teacher that really stands out as your biggest influence? Maybe your first teacher or your last teacher? Or No. Uh, well, the first one you said, Bill Bing. Bill Bing was, uh, man, that guy. He was my first teacher. I won the scholarship in high school for a jazz festival for doing uh, a little trumpet solo and playing some lead stuff. So I got like this $250 scholarship for private lessons. Uh, my my parents found Bill Bing through a bunch of referrals, and um, I studied with him. He gave me tons of stuff, but once that money, you know, uh, got used uh, with Bill, uh, my parents couldn't afford. You know, I think at that point he was maybe charging sixty or seventy dollars a lesson, which you know it's not a lot, but for for a family who doesn't have that kind of money to 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 be using every single week, it gets expensive. So. My parents told them that we can't afford anymore. So we're gonna have to stop lessons. You know, Bill said, "No, you're gonna free lessons for forever." <laughs> so somebody who can do that and have that big, big enough heart to do that—it's a, that's amazing. Right. So when did you decide you wanted to be a trumpet player for a living, and mm -hmm. when did you, if it's happened, decide that you could actually make it happen? Well, <laughs> I never really thought about it. Um, I mean, obviously, when you get your first paycheck uh, or a first gig, whatever, from whatever, uh, the money from it, you're like, wow, you're paying me to do this, something I really enjoy, I really have, you know, I love. Uh, but at a very young age, uh, even in high school, I went to an art school here in Los Angeles called uh, Hamilton, uh, uh, what's the um, Music Academy of the Arts in Hamilton in Los Angeles. And while I was there, I mean, I remember my senior year, I was doing brass ensemble, brass quintets, wind ensemble, jazz band. I was doing two musicals a semester and jazz combo. So already then I was already living that sort of college life of always playing. Um, and in my mind, I had no no doubt that I wasn't that I wasn't going to I wasn't do this for a living. I was going to make play trumpet for a living, not knowing what a salary was for 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 trumpets players, I just decided I'm just going to do whatever I can to make this be uh, not just a hobby, just, you know, it's going to be my livelihood. Okay. And um, 
let's talk a little bit about gear and then we'll get into your actual practicing and stuff. And then we'll open it up to anyone sure. who has some questions for you that are probably better questions than I've been asking. But, uh, <laughs> so what was, um, what was the first professional trumpet that you ever owned? It was a Bach 37 from the mid nineties. I bought okay. it brand new. My parents bought it brand new. So it was, uh, I, I think, a 97 or, or 96 trumpet that they, that they got. And that was the very first instrument I had. And then I know, like all of us trumpet players, you played a lot of different brands. And at mm -hmm. some point, you showed up um, at Stomba USA. Um, mm -hmm. You probably remember the first time better than I do because you're younger than I am. Um, <laughs> and I know you started playing a VR2 for a while. Yes and you were kind enough to get a lot of our instruments by a lot of our trumpets and stuff from us. And then it was a little more than a year ago, about a year before the coronavirus, yes. uh, <laughs> BC as I call it before coronavirus. Um, mm. I came to you and I said, Hey, uh, we've got these new four valve instruments and yeah. Pacho Flores is coming to town. I'd like you to do a recording with him. Are you, are you game and are you willing? Mm -hmm. And because you were a nice guy, you said yes. But why don't you tell a little bit about that story from, from your side and how you ended up switching over to the four valve instruments? Yeah, well, I remember I spoke to you. I'm not sure if it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And you, you mentioned about the four valve trumpet, but I did pick it up on a Friday. I came up to the shop and picked it up on the Friday. And when you when you told me what the instrument was, I've seen videos of John uh, uh, Ruff demonstrating it. And I've seen other videos of Pacho playing it. And he just wanted me to try it. I was like, I'll, I'll definitely give it a shot. If, I mean, I know the horn's going to be good. You know, can I use it? I have no idea. I mean, it probably won't be for me, but I know it's going to be a good horn. So I tried it at the shop. It felt great. Took it home. Um, the biggest thing I noticed was, man, was it uncomfortable to hold. <laughs> With all the tubing on the left side. So when you grip it, it's, it's just digging into your palm. So I was like, okay, it's probably not going to work for me, but I'm going to give it a good shot. Started playing it man horn feels great up and down the whole register the horn feels great and then i thought to myself you know this is a this is a extra large board trumpet it has it's slightly heavier because of the fourth valve it's it's bigger than what i'm used to and the vr2 in my mind it's a smaller instrument you know so i played it at home exclusively i haven't taken i had three gigs that weekend didn't take it out for any of those gigs uh, but i was thinking about it at those gigs so on Monday, I remember I spoke to you and I was like, hey, this horn feels great. I think I'm going to take it to Mike Perone's big band on Tuesday and uh, uh, play a few songs and see how it, how it feels in that setting. So I, I bring it on Tuesday, do about three or four charts on my VR2 with Mike Perone's big, big band. If you guys don't know who Mike Perone is, he's a, he's a former writer for the Carson, uh, the, uh, Jim, uh, what's his name? Carson. <laughs> Johnny Carson Tonight uh, Johnny Show. Carson, let's say Jimmy Carson. Johnny Carson Tonight Show for, for a long time. I wrote some incredible charts for them, some really hard charts. And I'm one of the lead players in this band currently. And he, uh, those charts are brutal. They're fun. They're, they're amazing. They push your limits, but they're brutal. Uh, did four songs on the VR2. And then I was like, I'm going to test out the four valve uh, Titan Copper Bell extra large for a trumpet. Tried one song. It felt great. Did another one. It felt great. I never put the horn down. I used it for the whole rehearsal. That was the most surprising thing to me, that this, what looks like a tank of an instrument, can project and sound like a lead trumpet player when it wasn't designed to do that. It, at least the, 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 the thing of the instrument wasn't, to do, wasn't meant to play high notes or, or lead trumpet. So when that happened, I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can give this horn back anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know since you, so just so everyone's clear, when you first got it, it was uncomfortable to hold, but then I know yeah. you figured out how to hold it. And Well, once I, you know, we all have this grip that we have, we hold the trumpet to, and we, to be honest, we depend on it to a certain point where it'll work against us when we start pushing too hard. And when that grip is there, you, you rely on it so much. Well, th this horn does not allow you to use your own grip, so you have to find a different way to do it. And when I found that different way to do it, so many other things changed that it improved for the better. I mean, I was able to control multiple octaves, especially with the new lower range I can get. 
you know, be able to play a double pedal F to a double high F, I can't do that on, on a regular three valve B flat trumpet. You know, on this four valve, I can connect essentially five octaves, you know, and the fact that I can do that completely changing my grip, that is, that just shows that everybody has habits that can be changed. Uh, you just have to be willing to change them, to be honest. Right, yeah. and you, and after you played that instrument for a while, which mm -hmm. was a, a loner actually, then you mm -hmm. ordered one and you and I went to Spain, you went to Spain to pick it up. That was yeah. dedication for sure. And <laughs> we spent a week, we spent a week at the factory and you'd never been to the Stombi factory. You'd mm -hmm. met and talked to some of my partners there. But mm -hmm. what was your experience with the factory? And I, I, I know you, you worked your butt off because you guys were recording stuff and writing stuff and having a good time. But did you take away anything um, about the music scene or something different in Spain from the U.S. or anything that you think the other people joining us here might be interested in? Well, when I, when I went there, uh, my expectations, you know, to be honest, I, I, I was so excited to get to go there and pick up my horn. I was just, that was the mindset. But what I was thinking, I think, well, I'm going to meet these people and they're, they're, they're more classically inclined, if, 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 I, if I can put it that way. It's, it's a very classical world uh, that they live in over there. So when I got there, here's a commercial player coming. I mean, I do classical, but I'm mainly a commercial player here in Los Angeles. And I'm going to come over here and pick up this horn that they built for classical soloists and orchestral settings. And I'm picking up this horn and I'm going to do about 25% of that work on that instrument. And the rest of it is going to be all commercial stuff. So I felt a little bad at first. <laughs> but when I got there and we had our first dinner and we talked and I was talking to Vicente Oronato, who's the president there, uh, or at least was, he's sort of quasi-retired now, maybe not, he's, but he's still working. But he, we were talking like crazy and it got to the point where we never talked about what styles we were working in or what styles we were playing. The main focus was the sound. It's always, for him and for me personally, it was always been, what's the sound you're going for? If you're playing in this style of music, you have to match that style. You're playing in, in the Baroque style, you have to match that style. You're doing 20s jazz or, or whatever, you have to match that style. So when we were talking in that way, we weren't talking about the music you were doing, you were talking about the sound you're trying to produce. And I gotta be honest, when he put it frankly, you know, the instrument is not a trophy. It's not a, it's not a, a person, it's a tool. It's a tool it's a, it, that projects your voice in the instrument and you have the right tool that makes your sound the sound that you're going for, for that musical situation. So when that conversation started happening like that, for me, my mind exploded because that's what I've been thinking the whole time I've been here in Los Angeles trying to play in this you know, studio scene or just what LA has to offer, excuse me, what LA has to offer where you're playing jazz or classical or everything in between. It's just going for the sound. And that's the whole purpose of playing the instrument because we're trying to produce the best sound we can at all times. So when we had the conversation, that completely shattered the ice and it was just easy going from then. It was a very, very amazing conversation, that first conversation we had. Interesting. Okay, yeah. well, everyone who knows you're playing and has watched some of your stuff on, on YouTube um, or knows you personally is chomping at the bit right now to know uh -huh. uh, about your lead pipe method because it's quite impressive. And mm. maybe you could just do a little bit of a, I don't know, chronology, what made you get onto it, how, what the value is, just sort of the, the okay. Javier extended elevator pitch about the lead pipe. And then maybe we'll, we can open it up for questions. All right, well, I actually took some notes for this particular question because, um, so I started writing a book for this. You know, I've been doing this lead pipe thing now since 2006 while I was doing my undergrad at Cal Arts, uh, California Institute of the Arts. Um, I was one of those guys who every semester I was doing about 20 to 24 credits. I was trying to play in every ensemble possible. I just wanted to play, play, play. At the same time, I was also working outside of school doing salsa music, pop music, and big band stuff. So I was playing so much to the point where physically it was catching up. Uh, and at this point, I spent many years working on the Bill Adams routine, the Clark, Clark Gordon routine, the James Stamp stuff. So they were all just, I internalized those, those workouts. So I had a very controlled range and technique. 
but then when I was playing roughly about 14 hours a day doing school stuff and then working outside of the school, um, I was noticing that those routines were not designed to deal with that lifestyle. Um, not that they can't do it, they, they, they most definitely can, but when you're going from different style of music to different style of music, uh, and your whole day is just different kinds of style of music. You're always adjusting, you're always changing mouthpieces to get the right sound. I was I was losing my chops because I was just playing way too much. And I was at school on a scholarship and uh, I got scared. And thankfully this is between 2005 to 2006, summer vacation type of thing. I, I sat down and went back to the basics on all those three methods and I sort of combined them. Um, and while I was at school, I was playing a bunch of world music, lots of world music that has, you know, multiple different influences. I picked up playing didgeridoo, which that's an amazing tool to really relax the chops and understand your breathing and learn how to circular breathe. I was doing a bunch of vocal cast, uh, classes to really understand what's happening with your body and breathing because vocalists and wind players use the same muscles with your diaphragm, your, your throat, your cheeks, everything works the same. Uh, so I, I got to the point where I just started playing with, with the lead pipe. Um, and for about six, seven years, I was just playing the lead pipe, trying to do scales and arpeggios and all that stuff. And I just started realizing that I was really, really, really making my life easier, um, playing all these, whatever I had to play. So I got to the point where, you know, the, the Claude Gordon, which is the Claude Gordon routine, which is the routine I spent most time on, wasn't allowing me to uh, really rest enough because that workout is exhausting. You gotta, you have to do an hour or a half an hour of a certain routine, take a 15 minute break and do another hour of this other stuff that takes you all over the place and take another break and then come back and do more things. When you're at school, you don't have time for that. There, there really isn't no time to really maintain that. Uh, I mean, obviously there is, if I would have lightened up my load and did my thing, but you know, I, I, I wasn't doing that. So I just had to figure out a different way. So I started doing the lead pipe stuff and it was just allowing me to set the chops at the very beginning of my workout uh, on the trumpet and just set them and not overdo everything on the lead pipe. You know, the lead pipe has these breaks that exist. We all know, and we all know about them. We've all tried them. They're awful. They feel awful. But if you can master playing through them to the point where you make them disappear, you're doing a lot of things on your chops uh, you're, you're not just working your lips, your tongue placement, you're working the inside of your mouth, you're working with your diaphragm, you're to the point where you use a lot more air efficiently without pushing a ton of air out. Um, so for me, the lead pipe was the light bulb that went off in my head that connected my long, crazy days while I was doing my undergrad and master's. So for me, the lead pipe, it's, uh, it basically saved my educational career at Calif and my professional career. So it's your, it's your home base. It's definitely my home base, for sure. Yeah. And you are working on a, a book about it. Yeah. So I am writing a book. Uh, the, I have it's, it's almost done. I mean, I have all the stuff written now, all the literature is written now. But the, the biggest reason I haven't brought it out yet is because, you know, I spend a very very long time developing it, and I'm really really good at it it's very difficult to go back and not be able to do it correctly the way I do it. So I've been training myself to figure out how to do it incorrectly so I can better explain to a person who's beginning to do it uh, and what to do to manipulate those partials to exist when they don't really feel like they exist. They do exist, they're there. But we have to train ourselves differently. I mean, it's not, the lead pipe is definitely the furthest thing from the traditional approach to the trumpet. It's if you think the traditional approach to the trumpet, the lead pipe will not work uh, because we overthink things and the instrument is not fully assembled. You're just playing the lead pipe itself with your mouthpiece, any mouthpiece really. So you really have to focus on what's happening with your body and not just the instrument or your mouthpiece. It's all happening in your, the way you breathe and what's happening in the inside of your mouth, your cheeks, uh, tongue placement. Uh, I know you and I have talked about, you know, about one specific thing I said about you know, when I lift my tongue, which is a big negative, you know, no, no thing everybody in the, in the trumpet world says, because it gives you a nasally sound or you play very, very sharp or out of tune. Um, I don't have that issue because when I think about lifting that tongue arc, 
which gives you a smaller space in the back. So here's your tongue, here's your mouth. When you lift that tongue up, you tend to create a very small space. I've developed a way to expand, not just this way, but to expand this way to make up the difference to not give you a nasally sound. Uh, and that's very, very difficult to, tr to translate how to do that without having the correct literature and video examples to do that. So that's why I'm taking my time to make sure it's laid out correctly step by step. Yeah, let's pause there for a second. That was a big eye opener for, for me. That's why you and I talked about it a lot where uh -huh. I had maybe just me being stupid, but I had heard for many years from different teachers about lifting the tongue or not lifting the tongue. But if you lift it too high, you get that nasal small sound and mm -hmm. obviously you don't. And what you're doing is you're actually changing the shape of your mouth to yes. a different note, like a singer would do, correct? That's exactly it, yeah. And to be honest, we uh, as instrument players, we do that already. Actually, everybody in this room right now who's watching is capable of doing this. I mean, when we're, when we're having a conversation with the person next to you, we tend to speak a certain way. And when we're trying to get somebody's attention on the other side of the room, we tend to, we change the whole thing of our mouth to have our voice project to the other side of the room to get that person's attention. So we're doing that naturally already. Uh, it's just uh, on the instrument, we have the sound coming out the bell, so we're not fully aware uh, as we are on, on the instrument uh, when we're doing it. So I first really noticed it when I was playing didgeridoo. And didgeridoo, when you're playing those bar shows and you start moving your tongue around or changing the syllables, you make a pitch, uh, you start hearing sound develop that's very round and full, or you can make it very nasally and, and, and flat. And you're doing that with one single pitch, which is changing the shape of your mouth and tongue placement. So for me, that was one of the things that became apparent when I did lots of didgeridoo, just understanding that whatever happens in my mouth affects the sound you're producing outside of the instrument. Cool. And so do you believe that working on the lead pipe like you have done for many years helps you learn how to do that? To, to In order to get those breaks to go away, you, you must have to manipulate the oral cavity and things like that. So has it, was it, did it help you achieve that even more? Oh, yes, for sure. It, it, it really, um, I mean, again, it's trumpet. Trumpet, there's days where we have great days and we have bad days as well. So every day it's like a, a new learning experience because maybe the day before you had a long fortune hour day playing trumpet and so you're going to be swollen. So like after, example there, after a fortune hour day of Dancing with the Stars, the next day what I do to recover, I'll wake up about 10 o'clock because you want to catch up on some sleep. Um, and then I will put on my drone and play pitches in the lead pipe just to make sure everything's settled. And if it's swollen, I do it for a little longer. Uh, it's not about volume, it's about, or loud volume, it's about playing everything very soft and controlled. So that's where I started off. And I start moving up and down partials to make sure everything's working. Uh, it, it's, it's almost like you're checking the damage you did yesterday. And if there isn't, that's great. And if there is, now we're going to do certain things to take care of that da or to help that damage. You know, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's almost like buzzing your lips. It's very similar to buzzing your lips or, or doing the uh, uh, mouthpiece buzzing or stuff like that. It's, it's all relative. It's all the same type of thing. You're just checking, making sure everything works. But on the lead pipe, because it's so similar and different from the entire trumpet, because you're, you're dealing with the exact device that connects the rest of the instrument. But now you're removing the tuning slide and you have these breaks that exist on the lead pipe. And now you have to go and work really hard to make all these partials exist when they don't exist. And that takes a lot of, a lot of work and patience. Okay. How's about if we uh, open it up to some questions, uh, assuming okay. there are some questions. Um, and I, I don't see everybody here. If there's any, uh, uh, female trumpet players watching. Let me just answer the first question. Javier's already spoken for. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so if someone has a question, I don't know, raise your you, hand. Unmute, you. <laughs> unmute and chime in. Javier, it's Terry. Hi, Terry. Where are you? Hey, good, good, you. good, good. Yeah, yeah so uh, I've been uh, using your uh, lead pipe uh, process uh, for the last few weeks, actually, I started working on it quite a bit after the quarantine started and all that, so I have lots of time on my hands. And so I guess the question now is, so 
have more improvements to make on that break. And I want to work on the higher break as well. But in your playing now, what are you looking to improve? Like you obviously still do the lead pipe, but are there little fine points or is there something that you think about? I know Jim Manley says every day when he gets up, he thinks about how can I play the trumpet with less effort? How can I play the trumpet? You know, like, mm -hmm. and this, the nice thing about the lead pipe is just that it's a tangible physical, it's there if you can make it mm -hmm. the, the right partial speak, you know, anywhere close to, you know, to what would sound like a trumpet, then yeah. everything else. So, I mean, the thing with the lead pipe, it's, you know, um, it, it takes more effort to make the partials exist, correct? On the lead pipe. Right. right so right. what that does is it allows you to become very aware of what muscles and tongue placement and airflow uh, it makes you very aware of all those things. So um, the, the goal is not to make, obviously you want the lead pipe to sound as good as possible on any partial, but the, the goal in reality is to make the instrument itself sound better with less effort and, and, and less, less force to make, it, to make it happen. So for me, when I first started doing the lead pipe uh, and when I was doing my undergrad, it was more about how can I get everything working without having to do the long routines I was already doing. Uh, not that not that the lead pipe is a sort of a fast track to get there type of routine, because I I don't recommend a beginner to do this type of stuff if you haven't worked on. Sure, you know, sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean if, if if you've done a James Stamp routine or or Claude Gordon with Bill Adams or some other type of Irons method maybe, then you're you are you are ready for this, but. Mm -hmm. It's all the whole purpose is to be aware of what's happening uh, with all your muscles, not not just your the inside of your mouth. You're talking about your cheek as well, because all these muscles up here are very very important. So when you're actively working on those and not only on the lead pipe, uh, you're you're just very aware and not being blocked by the sound of the trumpet. You just have the lead pipe and you, you hear what sounds bad and what sounds good. Yeah, no, it's cool. I really appreciate. I really appreciate it. And also, Ko's giving me little, you know pointers along the way too that uh you know he's uh, it's all in a, a lot of it is just a mental thing you know how to approach it how to think about it and yeah yeah it's, it's a big uh, mental game for sure cool anyone else uh, i have a question uh abner abner yeah abner, abner, excellent. <laughs> yeah uh, when you when well i what those days what well, i knew here i'm well it's my first time hearing you like talking about light people uh, lip pipe, sorry, I knew the language. Or <clears throat> the lip pipe, um, how do you work that? In what do you focus when you work in the, with the lip pipe? So when I, what I focus the most is the sound quality. So if you're right. getting a very, I mean, no matter what, you're getting an airy, buzzy sound on the lip pipe, but the goal is to get to the point where you have more sound versus uh, buzziness. Uh, and yeah. I, don't mean play, I don't mean playing louder. I mean, just getting a more core sound coming up from the lead pipe. So that's what, you, uh, that's what you want to focus on, just getting a clean sound. So when you start moving partials, it's going to get airy, but you have to figure out sort of finagled a way to get to the point where you're getting a very, very full clean sound throughout the whole range. Yeah, for example, because I have been working like, I start with a routine of singing. Mm -hmm. After that, I go into a routine of like whistling, trying to tune in my ear. Okay. I do uh, concert C major uh, to, to octave with the lips. After that, okay. with the with the mold piece, and after that, with my trumpet, I try to do son chico, which going to G yeah. G natural to G double high. Okay, and it's like it's trying to to get focused that. But how do you how do you think in the lead pile? How, what do you feel when you are working with the extra high notes with the double high notes yeah, so, so the what i was saying earlier about creating more space in your cavity of the mouth so on the lead pipe if you don't adjust and manipulate to get those partials on the higher part of the lead pipe it's not going to happen you have to understand what's happening in your mouth to get to that point because you can only lift your tongue so high to get those notes 
So once you lift too high, those notes won't start coming up anymore. They, they, they'll, they'll disappear. So you have to figure out a different way. You're, you're pretty much, you, you lift your tongue a certain amount and then you compensate by widening somewhere else. So you're having a more resonating chamber in your mouth to get those high notes to, to, to happen. Um, so you have to figure out the best way for you because you know everybody in this room has different yeah. size lips, different teeth placement, different size tongue. So I can't tell you exactly how to do it. The sound of the lead pipe is the best feedback you can get. So you want to just have the cleanest sound when you're connecting. So if you're going up the lead pipe, and you can say you're going just up a uh, uh, F major scale, do do da di da da da, and you're going, it goes da, and it's not coming out clean. Then you're not transitioning correctly. When we do slurs, we're always adjusting those slurs, da i a i a i a i a with the tongue and all that stuff with the lips. Uh, going down the half step, die, 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 all that stuff. We're, we're, we, we know what's happening. But on the lead pipe, there's no slots that exist like that besides the breaks. So you have to get to the point where you're making all those slots sound like a real instrument by changing what's happening in the inside of your mouth and supporting your air correctly. And the feedback from the lead pipe, depending on how what the sound is, will give you the results. If it sounds bad, it's, you're not doing it correctly. You, you want to have a nice, full, clean sound. All right. Yeah. So you understand what that means? Like just again, again that the, yeah. again, you can you can only lift your tongue so high before you start lo you lose the sound, and you get a very thin nasally sound. We don't want that. We always want a big full sound, not loud, just full. All does right. That, does that help? Yeah. Thank you so much. It's so wise. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, Javier. Javier, <laughs> John Ruff here. Got a hey, question. John. Uh, can you talk about like teeth alignment and jaw position a little bit and what what that means for you, uh, whether it's on the lead pipe or the horn? Do you mind doing that? So teeth alignment. Can you elaborate teeth alignment? on that? Well, okay. I don't want to, I, I mean, I'm not going to assume anything. Let's just go there. Uh, okay. what, I'm, what I'm talking about is like, are your teeth lined up vertically or is your front in, you know, top teeth in front of the bottom teeth, bottom teeth okay. in the front of the that and then and then what is your jaw doing throughout because when you're talking about the manipulation you're talking about the manipulation of many many things and yeah. I, one of the things that really intrigues me is teeth alignment and also jaw positions and i'm out you go awesome so i understand what he's saying now so when i know i know when i play the instrument and how i figure out the lead pipe stuff in order to connect smoothly from one partial to the next or from one octave to the next, we're always doing these micro adjustments. Um, and again, since we don't all have the same teeth size or lip size and all that stuff, we're always, we, it's, we're always starting from a different starting point. So when I'm adjusting on the lead pipe specifically, going from one octave to another octave or from a, a third to a fifth, moving up and down, um, for, for me, alignment of the teeth is equal to having a good sound. So it's always about the balance of where the sound's coming from. So it doesn't matter how your setup is, it matters what the sound quality is. And then for, that's the first stop, the first uh, starting point. Once you have that first sound, good sound on that first partial, now we have to move to the next partial. So when you start moving to the next partial, you're adjusting. So at that point, you want the sound to be the best possible to get to the next partial. So whether where your teeth are, if you're moving up to the next partial and it doesn't sound good, you have to adjust. So for me, I don't have a set way of what I think about that. I just think about how can I connect this partial from this next partial and what do I have to do to adjust to get to that point clean. You know, so, you know, even when you're doing scales or arpeggios on the instrument with the lead pipe in there, I'm always thinking about that. You know, one great example or exercise is that Clark Etude or not A2 exercises where you're just doing chromatics and triplets, all that stuff. Going, uh, it's, a, it's a two octave routine or it's a one octave routine, but you can extend it to two octaves. When you're starting on the low F sharp, going to the F sharp right above the staff, you're micro adjusting by half steps going up and then you have to come back down. So when you go up, you're tightening and when you come back down, you're loosening. So your teeth placement have to be in the right spot to make that sound clean and full with the full sound and the partials being exact. Does that sort of uh, answer what you're going for? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> so maybe let's explore that just a teeny bit. So when you're moving up and down in register, things are moving in your in your mouth. Can it, it, um, 
do you feel like you're opening and closing depending upon register or moving up and forward? Or, I mean, I'm kind of looking for how you perceive motion because again, you talk a lot about the tongue, which is, you know, that's a a very amazing process that you've got going when you're talking about widening. That's, I'd never thought about that and an explanation of that. And that's absolutely wonderful because I believe that to be very, very important Mm-hmm. that you people don't think about they're thinking about you know, they only think about the arch but not necessarily that that widening it out and and right. giving yourself some more uh uh cavity to work with but but to me i think our jaw and our teeth position are are equally important when we're trying to transcend registers and find those notes i'm out awesome yeah so when i for example when i do a multi multiple octave arpeggio or scale um i am starting from like a that one example I did on that A2 where I start from a double pedal F, I'm starting yeah. with incredibly wide aperture and jaw placement to make that double pedal F sound full. So while I'm ascending two octaves to the F in the staff, my jaw is starting very, very low and very open and I'm closing up. I, I am tightening up and closing and that, uh, that tongue arc is going up, but I'm also expanding a different way to get to that point. Uh, but as I said earlier, once you get to a certain port of arc, you can't go any further. So you have to adjust somewhere else. So when I'm doing that, I am tightening. I am, I want to say, it's more of the of the muscles of the face. You know, they start out real low, so they go up, and then the tongue goes up, and then the the, the face muscles take it over even more. So I'm I'm that's why a lot of people have talked or asked or seen my face, and I'm using the smile smiling effect, and that smiling effect. People talk about it as a bad thing, and I use it all the time, and I have the correct sound that they're 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 not used to hearing by using that technique. But I'm also I'm also targeting five octave range and connecting. That's the only way you can do that if you're going to connect a double pedal F to a double high F and then come back down. Um, there's no there's no trick to it besides doing it and doing it correctly so you don't hurt yourself. So I'm always adjusting. Uh, starting very low, relaxed, adjusting higher, higher, higher. The tongue is up. Now the cheeks take over and go to that high extreme note. You know, and the partials up there, as many people know, once you get to a certain register, you can do any scale without using any valves. So you're relying on your intonation and sound quality to get to those extreme high notes. Uh, and it's all about understanding what's happening in your face <laughs> muscles and understanding with the partials and the airspeed and the, the sound you're going for. You know, so yeah, everything everything is moving, of course, and adjusting for what's what I'm trying to do. Is that better? <laughs> All right, cool. Thumbs up. <laughs> and this hey, is my, this is very my, this is very clinical what you're saying right now, but this is practice room stuff because I've seen you on the gig and you're not thinking about where your tongue's going and if you're lifting your left elbow and pointing to the east, you're just hearing right. the music and playing it, correct? Yeah. Correct. I'm not thinking about it. I, I think about it in the practice room and w- that's that's in practice. And then once I go into the world, it's the job. It's it's just, you know, we're here to do a certain sound, a certain style of music, and we're going to do it to the best possible of my abilities. And that's, that's it. You know. I heard a clinic that Maynard did one time. That's one of the advantages of being old. You have a lot more stories. <laughs> uh, one time in a clinic setting, someone asked Maynard, if he thought about the, you know, how he wrote, how he filled the horn and what he did and so forth. And his comment was, it depends. He said, as long as everything is working properly, I don't have to think about it. Yeah, I start, right. I start thinking about, and I'm conscious of the pivot when I have trouble. So, yeah. And, and we all come, come, uh, come to that when we, when we have, when everything works, we don't fight, when it's, when it stops working, we start questioning it. Hey, John Rudd, can you turn off your mic? <laughs> I thought I did. I thought I did. Hang on, hang on. Uh, good. Uh, so Hi, again, I, when- my name's my name's Mike, and my son Braxton would like to have a question. He has to ask you before he goes to bed. Oh, sure, sure. When you were in eighth grade, how long did you practice? When I was in eighth grade. I was practicing at least three hours a day. Not, I mean, not every single day, but at least three or four days a week. I was definitely, especially on the weekends, I was putting in easily three hours, easily, in front of the TV mostly. <laughs> yeah, 
no worries. So make sure you practice, man. <laughs> All right. Javier, do you think yeah. it's necessary to play every day? In other words, do you take days off? Um, I think uh, Pacho Flores put it best, you know, when when you're tired, you take time off. That's that's all. You, you, you shouldn't practice. If you're fatigued and tired and you have the time to take off, take off the time. You know, d definitely. Um, the most I'll go without playing is no more than a day, but definitely a full day just to to make sure uh, I don't I don't make any more difficultness happening in the lips. But definitely take some time off if you need it for sure. I mean, still think about music for sure, but but definitely take a break. Javier, Gary here. Yes. Hey, yeah, Gary. Uh, question: Can you talk a little bit about corner sets versus being a re relaxed corners and how you treat that during the, the through the different registers? Okay. Well, for me personally, my corners are always stiff. They're always tightened. Um, I don't think about. Um, if you ever get to the point where your lips are real loose, you start noticing little air bubbles of saliva that start building up in the corners of your lips. That happens often when people uh, have that sort of loose looseness or, or relaxed in the lips. Uh, I noticed that a long time ago by watching a bunch of people who will sound great on one song of a big band chart or salsa thing or pop chart. And then the next song, uh, there was too much change happening. So they started missing notes. Uh, not that I was thinking about it at that way, but I came to realize that if you're always playing with uh, these these this sort of uncontrolled setups, uh, you you have less uh, success in going from one style of song to the next style or one playing lead trumpet to second trumpet. Uh, for me, I do play with a loose setup, but it's always firm. Like uh, the video I did recently for the uh um west end blues thing i'm playing the flugelhorn uh in the extreme low register and uh aside from the the last flugelhorn part which is flugelhorn to the bass flugelhorn i was playing with the extremely loose li lip to get those double pedal f's but everything else i was playing right from on the mouthpiece nothing was happening in the corners everything was always just firm uh, but what I do, which happens a lot, uh, actually, there's a, 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 an amazing trumpet player named Dan Rosenboom, who has a book out right now called The Boom Method, who talks about breath attacks and the importance of attacks, where you don't rely solely on just going with your tongue and having this real set. You, you rely on the attack of the air, where it sounds like a tongue attack. So, which means you can only do that if these corners are firm. You can't do that if they're if they're re if they're sort of relaxed. So even though I am relaxing when I'm jumping through registers, it's still with a firm intent in my mind, at least. Does that does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. So you, you mentioned the back of your tongue you raise and lower, I guess, to go through the lead pipe, um, different uh, partials. What is happening with the tip of your tongue while you're doing that? Well, the tip of the tongue, uh, it's in, for, for me, I know a lot of people have different starting positions for their, for their, when they're attacking notes going to, 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 but when I'm doing solely slurring type of, uh, uh, uh stuff, my tongue is always in the very top of the very, mm, I want to say the tip of it is almost the very bottom of the gums or bottom of the teeth on top of the gums. That's where I'm thinking at. But that tends to move around when you start articulating things and stuff like that. So it, it's it's ever changing. Right. Yeah. So again, like especially with the whole tongue movement, um, it sounds drastic the way I'm putting it. That I'm lifting the tongue crazy. They're all micro steps. They're, they're not. It's not an excessive moving and, and jumping down. It's all very minimal. So so when you say lift that tongue arc, I am lifting it, but there's still a lot of space to go. Sure. You know, so, sure. Yeah. Sure. So, so it just depends on the, again, it's all about the sound I'm trying to achieve or, or to get. And it's always about the full sound. You want to have a full sound on any, whether it's the shallowest mouthpiece or the biggest mouthpiece, you always want to have the biggest sound. Like uh, a big example is Jim Manley over there. I see you. Hey, Jim. Jim, I, I played your mouthpiece, Jim. It's small as hell, but man, he gets such a huge sound on it. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you have a bigger small or small mouthpiece, you can still achieve a full sound. 
uh, a new a mouthpiece that Ko made for me. Actually, he made for me I think two years ago, and it finally got made into a, a single piece mouthpiece. That mouthpiece is very very shallow, but I can I can play all over the registers, and I get a big full sound on the register uh, because again I'm going at the end of the day we're always going for that big sound or the full sound. I want to say big sound. You want a full sound, you know. That's so. It just depends on how you you're perceiving the sound. More importantly. So here's a good question. Do you think of yourself as a gearhead? Um, I want to say yes, but in reality, I'm not. I know lots of guys who have a big box of mouthpieces. I have a small box of mouthpieces, and they're all mostly chaos, <laughs> you know, and, and, and his mouthpieces are always in rotation. Um, I've only had, I mean, right now I have lots of trumpets at home because I have a whole new set of four valve trumpets. Uh, but if they didn't exist, I would only have one C trumpet, one B flat, one flugelhorn, one piccolo, um, and that, that's E flat, D flat, and that's really it. I don't have tons of gear because um, people tend to change gears on a regular basis because they haven't figured out what's happening. They're thinking the gear is going to change your setup for you, and it really isn't the case because uh, I got to be honest, uh, when I was working on the Etude, uh, the Clark Etude, I did it on every single mouthpiece that I own. I have this really old Bach one and a quarter uh, that I can do the Etude on. Not not clean, but I can get through everything. I have, I, I tried it on Jim Manley's mouthpiece that I still have, and I can get through it, but you have to figure out a way to do it. So you, it's possible to adjust to any mouthpiece. Um, so you, it's, it's all, again, it's all about the sound you're going for and not overthinking about the gear. The gear is not going to do the job for you. You know, it's it's 90 percent the person and 10 percent the gear, to be honest, or, or maybe less than that. <laughs> you know, so. OK, here's a quick a real quick uh, uh, reminder, if you guys aren't sure. And then let's take one more question. And then Javier has given us a good hour of his time and we'll thank him for that. But so if you guys aren't doing anything too nice from tonight, the same time, 530 Pacific time. I'm going to be doing another Zoom event with Thompson Music. That'll be yeah. all about gear. You know, you can ask me questions about trumpets, mouthpieces, that kind of stuff. 530, if you don't have the information, uh, send me an email, kale at stomby-usa.com, and I'll send you the info. So do we have another question out there for Javier, someone who hasn't asked one yet? Anybody? Any takers? <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> all right. So earlier you were talking about um, how much you're using the four valve trumpet. But my question is how often do you use the extreme low register on the job? Obviously when you're doing the etude stuff or the trumpet ensemble stuff, the extra low register comes in handy a lot. But I'm curious if anyone is writing music that you're using, you know, the, the low F, low E, E flat, all that. Well, I did this, uh, this film uh, in March of last year uh, before Kale and I went to Spain where I was in the studio uh, doing this sort of quasi Chinatown type of thing where it was just strings with rhythm section and just trumpet. I was the only uh, wind player in there. And I saw the music, it was, it was awesome music. It was beautiful ballet stuff. And I started playing with the four valve trumpet and just warming up and really going down to those low pedal notes. And at that moment, while I was doing that, getting this big burly sound down there, the composer runs out of the booth uh, and walks up to me and uh, she says, I did not know trumpet can go that low. And because she wrote this one specific line on this one specific piece that was going down to the low G and then it jumps up to the F above that, you know, and she kind of wanted, she was thinking of a, she thought, or she was thinking more of a flugelhorn sort of trombone type of sound going down there, but she wrote everything for trumpet. So at that moment, I actually, she modified the piece for it to go down to the low, it ended up in the low pedal D, but she wrote, she changed the piece to go down there after hearing the instrument. So, I mean, that was the first incident for, for something like that had happened. It's not that music doesn't exist right now for it, it's just that people are not, haven't been aware yet, and they're more aware now that these instruments have these new possibilities. You know, Pacho Flores has all these concertos and pieces that he's touring the world with where he's using the whole range of these instruments. And the more people, more writers get in touch, or not in touch, but uh, understand that these instruments are capable of going down there, um, they'll be writing more stuff for it. I mean, uh, my buddy and I, Aaron Smith, are now on a roll just writing a, a bunch of stuff now where you can hear the 
the range of the, the low flugelhorns and the low C trumpets and the low B flat trumpets going down there. So it's only a matter of time before you start seeing new music or old music revamped to accommodate these new instruments. Yeah, so it's but only probably, a But probably 99% of your playing now, you don't go down uh, to those low notes, but you're still using the four valve instead of the VR2 that you used to use. <laughs> What's Correct. the reason? Is it a sound thing? Is it an ease of play? It's a sound thing. <laughs> I got to be honest. I love the VR2. The VR2 is one of the greatest instruments I've ever played in my life. It's am amazing. But when K.O. introduced me to the VR2, uh, to, the, to the four valve, man, there's just something about the overtone series that exists on that instrument that doesn't exist on the VR2. Even though the VR2 has that bell flex that has that crazy overtone series, there's a lot more sound-wise uh, or the harmonics happening with the four valve. And I, I, it's difficult to explain because it is happening with the four valve, but it's much more apparent with the, with the four, uh, sorry, it is happening with the three valve, but it's much more apparent with the four valve. And I, I gotta be honest, uh, I could not get a clean sounding uh, recording of the etude uh, on the three valve trumpet because I was overshooting higher notes or not getting the correct sound or right partial. And once I got the four valve, man, everything was just locking in. Like I've been practicing it a lot. So it's just, there's something happening with that four valve. Uh, Kayla explained to me that it really, it, it, it's like you're picturing like a six string guitar or a bass where you start, you know, you start strumming it and there's more overtones happening. You know, you don't really use that one gu string guitar more uh, but it gives you a bigger sound on the, on the actual instrument. And it's the same thing for the trumpet. I can play lead on it all day. I can play section stuff on it all day. I can do the classical stuff. And it's just, there's something happening that allows me to hear the partials in any register even clearer. But also from that too, it blends really well with the section. I've done a bunch of big band albums this last year. And man, you cannot tell that I'm playing a four valve trumpet. So it's like, it's, it's pretty amazing. And you told me a story that you did a session, um, if I get it wrong, correct me, but I think it was, it was you and everyone else was probably playing Yamahas mm -hmm. and you, you played some lead in some section parts and you didn't have any problems, right? Nobody had any problems. Everybody looked at me like, oh, why is he bringing this thing? <laughs> and then they hear the stuff in the booth and it's like, oh man, everything sounds as it should. So, you know, it's, people tend to look with their eyes before with their ears, you know, so... <laughs> You know they, they'll judge they'll judge the sound by the eyes by by looking at stuff first. So thankfully, as being one of the few first guys here in town playing this instrument uh, in these sessions, you get the looks first, but then you start working and all that goes away because this, it sounds really good. You know, so yeah. Okay. Well, Javier, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for joining us. Mm -hmm. Give any thank if you. anyone out there has any thank ideas you. for thank some you. other yeah. sessions, please send us an email. Let us know. Excellent. And everyone, everyone stay safe and get a lot of practice time in.